because of its sleek design, the aircraft lacked the standard bubble-style canopy, a customary feature on all single-man aircraft of the day. Without the bubble canopy, the pilot could no longer see to the rear of the craft. A problem if the pilot needed visual confirmation of any sort of malfunction with the airframe or power supply. In addition to the problem with the pilot's line of rear sight, the X-1 lacked pilot ejection capabilities. Because the tail wing of the aircraft was designed unusually high in order to withstand turbulence created by the flat side wings, any attempt by the pilot to eject from the aircraft while in flight would most likely result in a collision with the tail wing and a most gruesome death. From the perspective of pilot safety, many of the designers felt that the X-1 was extremely dangerous but they decided to stick with the bullet-like dynamics of the aircraft since prior attempts to reach the elusive speed of 1,268 feet or 386 meters per second had resulted in pilots losing control of their aircraft and for many, their lives. The next concern engineers and pilots faced was the fact that in order to get to Mach 1, the X-1 needed to be rocket-powered. Prior experience with jet engines proved that there were too many aerodynamic difficulties in getting air to the jets at such a high rate of speed for them to operate effectively. A rocket, engineers determined, would most surely get the pilots where they wanted to go. Still, use of a rocket meant that the pilot would have to sit on nothing less than a small explosion. Powered by a volatile combination of liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol, designers feared they were toying with disaster. Additionally, the X-1 rocket could only hold enough fuel to sustain full-speed flight for a little more than two minutes. This meant a land-based launch of the aircraft was impossible if the pilot was to reach Mach 1. The simplest plan had the X-1 being airlifted to an altitude of 25,000 feet in the belly of a B-29 bomber. Once the pilot was securely inside the X-1, the X-1 would drop, giving enough time to clear the B-29. The pilot would then fire the chambers to the rocket, hurling the aircraft and its passenger toward the speed of sound. Once the rocket ran out of fuel, the X-1 would glide to the ground. Still, no matter how much planning the scientists, designers, and pilots put into the eventual flight of the X-1, the facts still remained. They were a group of men about to make a giant move into uncharted territory. So unsure were those in charge of the X-1 program that on one night prior to the first test flight, a high-ranking X-1 official confided that he only wanted pilots without dependents. Tragedy, it seemed, was on the minds of everyone involved. Faced with the very real prospect of death, Slick Goodland, a test pilot at Bell Labs, said, I was just a very eager adventurer, and I loved flying. And besides, being involved in the hottest aviation project in the world causes one to overlook the basic fundamentals, such as pilot safety. While many test aircraft of the period were focused on aircraft distance, the X-1 program was all about speed. While the X-1 wasn't classified as a military aircraft, eventually the program was transferred to the military's newly formed Air Force. On early test flights, many of the pilots found it difficult to control the X-1 as it reached closer to the much sought after speed of 1,268 feet per second. Chuck Yeager, another test pilot for the X-1 program, recalled one such experience. We got the airplane up to 94% of the speed of sound, and I'm sitting out there, and I decide to turn the airplane. I pulled back on the control cock, and nothing happened. The airplane just went the way it was headed. And I said, man, we've got a problem. So I raked the rockets off and jettisoned the liquid oxygen and alcohol and came down and landed, and we got the engineers together, and we had a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. I said, we've got a problem, because the airplane may pitch up or down. I've lost the ability to control it. The morning of October 14, 1947, Chuck Yeager was preparing for another run with the X-1 when he asked a friend for a special favor. A day prior, Yeager had been horseback riding with his wife, Glennis. 
Jaeger's horse hit a fence, sending the young pilot tumbling, breaking a couple of ribs on his right side. As Jaeger suited up for the flight, he confided his problem to his friend Jack Ridley, telling him that in his current condition, securing the door to the aircraft without assistance seemed impossible. If the flight crew were to sense that Jaeger was for some reason physically unfit, they would most surely scrap that day's flight. Confident that the team was coming close to breaking the sound barrier, each flight had the potential to be the one for the young pilot. Ridley quickly devised a solution to Jaeger's dilemma, a broomstick. Once aloft in the belly of the B-29, Jaeger painfully sandwiched himself into the cockpit of the X-1. Using the broomstick Ridley had given him, Jaeger secured the cockpit hatch from the inside. With a checkout of the launching procedure completed between Captain Jaeger and the crew of the B-29, synchronized timing begins. Five, four, three, two, one, drop. Enveloped in the bright light of the sun, Jaeger counted to 10, ensuring a safe distance from the mother ship, and then fired the rockets. Scores of people connected with the X-1 flight program have expected the aircraft to surpass the speed of sound, and maybe this is it. Monitoring the Mach meter inside the aircraft, Jaeger felt the plane shake violently as he neared the desired speed. Suddenly, the Mach meter went off the scale, and Jaeger felt the smooth quiet of traveling faster than any human on Earth had ever traveled before. And he does it! The first human to crack the sound barrier! Now, with propellant exhausted, Jaeger reduces his speed and altitude to come in for a dead stick landing at 160 miles per hour. Test pilot Chuck Jaeger and his X-1 had gone supersonic. At this hot landing speed, the X-1 rolls for more than two and one half miles. And one of the Air Force's best known flight test pilots has just set the pace for further research in upper air investigation. This flight marks the first milestone in the supersonic chapter in the history of aviation. And you were there. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. President Kennedy's speech to a special joint session of Congress in May of 1961 set the world on fire with space fever. While still reeling from a major humiliation in the Bay of Pigs debacle, Kennedy's latest goal of sending a man to the moon gave Americans a new focus with respect to an old rival, the Soviet Union. Just try pushing Americans around and you'll get just about as far as the creek. Sure, sure, you'll find a few suckers here and there, the, the kind of guys that live by letting George do it. But you aren't going to fool anybody who knows anything about you. And remember some of those tricks you pulled over the last 30 years. And there's more than enough of us to take care of you. Political tensions between the two superpowers kept the fires of competition burning. It was clear to all this was going to be a close race. The Russians, in many respects, were already in the lead. The communists recognize education as a powerful social force and have exploited it to the full as an instrument of indoctrination. Their emphasis today is placed on technical, scientific, and practical training. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union changed history when it successfully launched Sputnik 1. This basketball-sized artificial satellite weighed all of 183 pounds and took slightly longer than 90 minutes to complete a full orbit of the Earth. Although the plans were well underway for an American satellite launch, 
Sputnik caught everyone off guard. The Russian success immediately spawned public fears in the U.S. as to the communist country's ability to reach American soil with a long range.